Good day. I am John Davis from the international law firm of Freshfields Brookhouse Derringer, speaking to you from London. Welcome to this ICN-sponsored program on competition agency use of advocacy to advance competition interests. Although attention is most often directed at the investigation of individuals and firms for violations of competition law, it's important to recognize that restraints blessed by government can be as or more anti-competitive than private firm activity. In some sense, governmentally imposed restraints, such things as tariff or other barriers to imports, quota systems and the like, can be more effective since they can cover wide swathes of the economy and since cheating may be punished as an infraction of law. Thus, competition advocacy with the goal of reducing or eliminating government restrictions is an exceedingly important function for a competition law enforcement agency. Changing a single government policy can be more effective in opening broad sectors of economic activity to the pressure of competition than any given enforcement action. In jurisdictions where there is a history of government management of sectors of the economy, there may be vestiges of unnecessary and frankly anti-competitive restraints that are still in place. Even in broadly liberal open economies, there are often protected sectors or industries often enjoying political support, which result in injury to the competition marketplace and to consumers. Private interests often seek to convince government to regulate their industries in ways that protect incumbents from unwanted competition. While businesses often complain about regulations, sometimes they work to secure regulation that will insulate them from competitive pressures. And regulations imposed for ostensibly positive public policy reasons, for example, to protect the public against substandard goods or services, may be used to protect incumbents against competition. This protection creates super competitive profits, which may in turn be used to finance extensive and fierce lobbying against any change. Regulation that may not be generally objectionable is sometimes used in ways to create entry barriers to the injury of consumers. Invocation of tariffs and similar trade measures can sometimes be used to police the pricing of more efficient foreign competitors to the benefit of local industry and the injury of local consumers. Health and safety laws or labelling laws, for instance, are sometimes abused to keep new entrants from the market in the guise of protecting the public. The professions, such as medicine and law, may have enjoyed privileged positions that have minimized competition in the guise of needed professional regulation that only the professionals are capable of enforcing. Oftentimes these restraints are enforced by the state. These restraints can be much more attractive because competition can be restricted in ways that may be perfectly legal. One need not risk the wrath of the competition authority and legal sanctions associated with price fixing if the would-be cartelists can convince government to impose a minimum price for a good or service, and then punish cheaters for a regulatory infringement. Unfortunately, competition advocacy oftentimes gets little or no attention at competition enforcement agencies. Several reasons may explain this phenomenon. First, it is not sexy. There is no surveillance of cartelists, no prosecution of bad actors, none of the trappings or excitement of law enforcement. Second, it is hard. Interests embedded within government can be just as tough or tougher than the price-fixing malfactor. And as any experienced competition advocate will hasten to add, there are lots of defeats. You must get up off the floor and have the resolve not to give up. When you do prevail and win, there are usually few accolades in the press or elsewhere. Lastly, agencies like businesses sometimes prefer the quiet life. We have more important things to do and why tangle with the people who fund the agency who may appoint its head if you don't really have to do so. Despite these challenges, 
Competition advocacy is important and should not be neglected. Many agencies, particularly new ones, sometimes limit their competition advocacy to educating the public about the benefits of competition generally. That is well and good. However, this module focuses on more ambitious advocacy, where the agency is confronted with a particular current or proposed government restraint, and it has to decide whether, and if so, how to proceed. Let's travel to Dublin and look in on how anti-competitive regulation is sometimes sponsored by private interests. Times are getting tough on me. It was fine when it's just the three of us operating pharmacies around here. Maybe there's two more. You know, it was okay when you were up on the high street, I was in the square, and then mm. you were on the Dublin Road. There's two more now. Offering reduced prices for prescriptions, family deals, and so on. One of them is in the shopping centre. That's really convenient for shoppers. Another one's much nearer to the doctors than we are. I don't know how long we can keep up with these guys. Yeah. I was talking to some of the people in the National Pharmacy Association meeting recently, and it's not just us. It's happening all over the country, and it's not sustainable. You know, it's, it's hurting the new guys as well as ourselves, you know? And maybe, maybe we could come to some sort of agreement before the next association meeting on how we can compete with each other. Well, look. I know that fixing prices is against the law, so obviously we can't do that. But, 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 maybe if we got the government to make a regulation limiting the number of new pharmacies, and maybe those regulations could have rules uh, laying down where pharmacies could actually be set up. That would certainly stop the new guys in their mm -hmm. tracks. It would. But, you know, the problem there is, like, why would the government want to help us out? I mean, everyone thinks we make a pretty good living. Mm. You know, it's harder to get into pharmacy than it is to get into medical school. And the government knows exactly how much pharmacies change hands for nowadays. Mm. Hold on a minute. What about the elderly? What about those with chronic illness? What about them? Well, maybe we could play the public health card. You know, if, if we make a case that if we're competing with each other to the extent where we all go out of business, how do people get their prescriptions filled? You know, you don't want the elderly having to travel long distances to get their prescriptions or those with chronic illness, you know, and a regulation might help that. But the thing is, you know, for example, the supermarkets, right. they get the business from, you know, mm. especially the out-of-town ones, they get the business yeah. from those who can drive, you know, those who are able. Mm. What about those who aren't? Sounds like a good idea, but you know, surely we can't stop someone setting up a pharmacy if they're a yeah. qualified pharmacist. Well, maybe we can't stop people setting up pharmacies, but we can certainly affect the way they make money. Look, remember, we all have community pharmacy contracts with the Department of Health mm -hmm. so that patients can get their drugs free or, or have them reimbursed by the state. What about maybe that we could get the government to make regulations to say that you can only get a government contract if you're a certain minimum distance away from the nearest established pharmacy. How about that? And that would be us. Yeah. Brilliant. Mm. I mean, the regulation could say something along the lines of, you know, you can't get a government pharmacy contract if you're, you must be at least in an urban area, maybe 500 metres yeah. from the nearest pharmacy, uh -huh. or maybe in a rural area, mm. five kilometres. Mm. Yeah, what about that? Yeah, well, hang on a second. My brother qualified as a pharmacist last year. He's looking to set up a pharmacy down near the railway station, have great you know, footfall, plenty of passing trade, but that's less than 500 metres away from me. Perhaps we could say 250 metres? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's, that's, that's that's sound, that sounds good. Reasonable. Look, the main thing to remember, though, is that it's not about our profits. Mm -hmm. right? It's a public health issue. It's about the sick, the elderly, getting their medicines and so on. As it happens, I have a cousin who's one of the organizers of, one of, the, of the senior citizens movement, and I know she'd do anything to help us and to help them. Maybe we could even get them to sponsor the idea. Sponsor? Yeah. And if it works, 
Well, that's great. And if it doesn't, well, yeah. we're no worse off. Genius. Folks, I think it's time we enlisted the help of the senior citizens. Sounds good. Sounds good. Cheers. 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 Well, listen, I'll stop in. I want to see the birthday picture. I'll see you. Hey, Han, how you doing? Hi, Malki. Did you see the senior citizen movement is proposing government passed legislation to prevent anyone to set up a new pharmacy within a certain distance of existing one? Even if they meet the distance requirement, they also have to say, so there is a demand in area. Can I see that? Oh, yeah, of course. I don't believe it. Look here, the Pharmacists Association has said that they welcome legislation such as this as it ensures the availability of community pharmacy services in rural areas and to the elderly. Such touching concern for the rural elderly. The Alcoci Division didn't know this was coming? Well, I certainly didn't. Listen, can I borrow this paper? I need to go talk to Kieran. Thanks. See you, Malky. Bye. Opportunities to advocate for competition arise in many different ways. The agency may be asked for its views by a parliamentary committee or a member of parliament. Interest groups may bring issues appropriate for advocacy to the attention of the agency. Or the agency may have had an issue under study for some time and take the initiative to advocate. Or as here, an issue may come to the attention of the agency because a case officer was reading a newspaper. Let's return to the authority and see what happens next. Have you seen this? Oh, I have, yes. My phone hasn't stopped ringing since first thing this morning. First of all, I have the consumer agency on. They're worried about legislation that will restrict choice for consumers. But they don't want to come out publicly against something that's been portrayed as benefiting the sick and the old. But they want to know whether we're going to do something. And then I had the National Pharmacists Association. Wait for this. They're supporting the legislation to ensure the availability of a community pharmacy service throughout the country. Isn't that great? They want to ensure the availability of a service by stopping people from offering it. Exactly. And then the minister rang. Uh-oh. Yes. She said she knew that we wouldn't be happy with a law that restricts entry. But she went on about the need to ensure the viability of local and rural pharmacies. And she said that it was important to protect them from competition. What did you say to that? Well, I thanked her for the call. Um, I told her that it would be inappropriate for me to take a view on legislation that I haven't yet read. And that in any event, it wasn't a decision for me, but rather for the authority to make. I told her we'd get back to her as quickly as we could, and she seemed to be happy enough with that. And then after her, I had the senior citizens mob on the phone. And they pulled no punches. We have to get behind them and urge urban rural solidarity and the availability of an even spread of services nationwide. So look, there's obviously a head of steam building up here and we need to do something. Right. Will you have a look at the ICN website mm -hmm. and see if any other agency has addressed this or a similar issue in the past? Mm -hmm. Have a look at the advocacy working groups uh, webpage. Down the left hand side, you'll see a link to postings from competition authorities. Right. And if memory serves me right, the US FTC have posted information on all of their uh, advocacy subjects uh, topic by topic right. and I'm almost positive that they have done something on pharmacy regulation. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work, email all of the agency representatives on the advocacy working group. There's no point in us trying to reinvent the wheel if another agency has done this already. Right, but we really need to get moving on this, don't we? We do, I'm afraid, so you can drop everything else, we'll deal with this and try and nip it in the bud now. Okay, we will do. Okay, thanks Malachi. Right, I found uh, 30 submissions on pharmacy regulation made by the US Federal Trade Commission to various parts of the US government. Now, unfortunately, there was nothing precisely like our issue, um, but there is some useful information there. On the UK, though, 
the, the government actually subsidises pharmacies to open on Sundays and bank holidays in areas where they wouldn't otherwise do so. Now, I couldn't find anything else from other agencies, but I've emailed those where we have a contact, but it's too early to hear back from them yet. Okay, well, like many of our uh, advocacy projects, this is a tricky one. Comments by us are useless unless policymakers will listen to us. So, as always, we're going to have to take a very measured perspective. And our advocacy programme is here for the long run. So, we don't want to uh, waste uh, uh, important capital needlessly on this issue alone. Now, I think we'd be more persuasive if we weren't the only ones who are saying this. So, if the ICN support us, we can use uh, that information to show that this is the perspective of governments all over the world. Now, I'm not sure that we are best placed to assess the optimal schemes for ensuring the delivery of uh, pharmaceuticals to um, Irish citizens. But let's assume that it is a bona fide issue and one that the government does need to address. Then the question turns to what is the most appropriate means of delivering this service? Well, I found an OECD report on regulatory reform in Ireland, which says that where there is a genuine public service obligation, like providing a loss-making service in rural areas, the solution is not to create a protected monopoly to cross-subsidise the unprofitable bits. Yeah, I mean, we don't even know that rural pharmacies are unprofitable. I mean, I've seen reports in local papers of pharmacies changing hands for substantial sums of money, even in underpopulated areas. Precisely. We need to establish the fact base here so that we can counter that assumption. Even if it turns out that there are loss-making areas, I agree with the point on cross-subsidisation. The most efficient way to establish this is to find out what areas need subsidisation, hold an auction for the delivery of those services, and let the one who comes in with the least requirement for subsidy win and deliver that service. It can be paid for by way of government grant, government subsidy, or by a special tax. But the worst way of doing it is to increase the prices to all pharmacy patients, because then it'll be the oldest, the sickest, and those most in need of drugs that will end up paying more. OK, well, I will put together a draft of comments doing three things. I'll firstly identify if there's a problem with access to pharmacy services. Secondly, I'll show that introducing restrictions to entry will only result in the protection of uh, business interests of existing pharmacists. And lastly, I'll conclude that if there is a supply problem in some areas, this could be resolved by considering a subsidy in appropriate cases. That would keep drug prices down for a majority of patients. Yes, hopefully this will be an attractive option for government. I think we may, may need to make the senior uh, citizen movement aware of our concerns in relation to restricting entry to, to a profession like pharmacy. Uh, we also need to persuade them that the subsidy option is a way to address their problems and concerns um, in areas where they think there's a problem with supply. Yes, and it's important that we address the responses that those who are promoting this regulation are likely to, to, to bring up. For example, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the subsidy proposal um, were countered on the basis that it will not address the issues of cream skimming in urban areas that affect the ordinary man and woman. That would have a nice populist ring to it, so we need to address that one early. From Dublin, we look to Professor James Cooper at George Mason University just outside Washington, D.C., for some practical guidance on how one can optimize the effects of agency advocacy interventions. Professor Cooper served in the Competition Advocacy Program of the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Hi, I'm James Cooper. I teach at the George Mason University School of Law, but before that I was at the FTC working in their Competition Advocacy Program. Today I want to talk about the role of empirical evidence in competition advocacy. Let's start at the beginning. What's the goal of competition advocacy? Well, broadly, competition advocacy is designed to help policymakers understand the importance of competition when they're making regulatory decisions. How do we typically do this? Well, depending on the status quo, competition advocacy often takes the form 
writing comments or giving testimony in opposition to regulations that unreasonably restrain competition, or in support of removing existing regulations that do the same thing. What do we put in our arguments? Well, it's pretty easy to find support for the general proposition that competition is the best way to organize a market, that it leads to superior outcomes in terms of lower prices or better quality, more variety for consumers. Although the benefits from competition are widely recognized, those advocating for restrictions on competition often ground their calls in claims of market failures. That is, a claim that without this regulation, the free market is actually going to harm consumers. And this proposition, that sometimes markets require government intervention to help consumers, is also widely accepted in the mainstream of economics. Again, take this quote from Gregory Mankiw's book. So, without evidence, competition advocacy can, also, can often come down to just one theory pitted against another. The previous discussion should have highlighted the importance of, peer, of empirical evidence in competition advocacy, which is the heart of my talk today. Why do we need empirical evidence? Well, it serves two main goals. First, it's going to help you arrive at the correct answer internally. It may be that the restraint in question actually harms competition. There may be a market failure that need, needs to be dealt with. It's important to understand the market setting well before you engage in advocacy. Second, once you've developed your, internal evidence, your empirical evidence internally, you can use this evidence to make your case to external policymakers. So what kind of evidence are you looking for? Well, first, you want evidence that the, re the restriction in question negatively impacts competition based on standard competition policy metrics like price or output or quality. Second, you want to know if there's a market failure, and if so, does the proposed restriction ameliorate it, or are there less restrictive alternatives? What types of evidence can we bring to bear? Well, I want to talk broadly about three tiers of evidence based on their usefulness. First is what I would say is general evidence that competition is better than regulation. For instance, empirical evidence that deregulated industries improve outcomes or that price ceilings create shortages. The second kind of evidence is in that what I would call analogous evidence. For instance, empirical evidence involving a restraint that's similar to but not exactly like the one in question, or involving a similar restraint but in a different market. And so general and analogous evidence can be persuasive. However, these kind of arguments, this kind of evidence, leaves you open to the, the yes but we're different argument. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, think of professional services. Restri restrictions on competition there are often met with, yes, we understand that advertising is good, but our services are too complex for consumers to understand. They can't evaluate price and quality correctly, so we need restrictions. Or another area the FTC has some experience in, online wine sales. Online competition is good, yes, but there's too much potential for harm for under, from underage drinking to allow online sellers to compete with offline sellers. These are what I would call the yes, but we're different arguments. And this is why you, you need what I'll call category number three, restraint-specific evidence. This is evidence that demonstrates that the specific restraining question is harmful to consumers. Returning to the examples that I just talked about, professional services. For empirical research led by the Federal Trade Commission in the 1980s and later picked up by outside academics showed that advertising professional services like legal services or optometry led to lower prices and had no adverse effect on quality. And take the online wine case. An FTC staff report showed that online wine sales allow consumers access to greater variety and lower prices and that there is no evidence that online sales led to, underage, to a greater incidence of underage drinking. So, how do we find the empirical evidence we need? 
Well, first, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. One place to look is peer-reviewed economics journals. For instance, the Journal of Law and Economics, the Journal of Industrial Economics, the RAND Journal of Economics, and the Journal of Regulatory Economics together publish over 100 articles a year that deal with many of these topics that examine the effect of regulation on economic outcomes. Second, you can in, in develop your empirical evidence internally. How do you go about doing that? Well, the gold standard for any empirical uh, test would be a randomized trial. That's rarely, if ever, available in economics. So the next best thing would be what we'd call a natural experiment or a quasi-experiment. There, you look for a regulatory change that can serve as an experiment where some group, whether it's an industry or jurisdiction, has, is affected by the regulation and another group is not. You appropriately control for confounding variables and use appropriate statistical techniques and hopefully you'll be able to identify the effects of the regulation in question by comparing the outcomes in the control group and the treatment group. Often, these sort of data, however, are not available or you may not have the time to conduct such an in-depth study. So you can use other methods, such as before and after comparison of a, group, of a single group, or comparing different groups at one instance in time. Finally, there's case studies. You can look at outcomes in depth of a certain jurisdiction where a regulatory change has occurred. This brings to mind another important uh, factor, what's what I call competition policy R&D, or Competition Policy Research and Development. For competition advocacy, it's important to identify issues early so that you can set up empirical projects in the pipeline. They'll be ready to go when you need them for advocacy efforts. So now I want to turn to the Irish example that we just saw. The proposal to place geographic entry restrictions on pharmacies fits the standard template. Competition may work generally, but not in my industry. Left alone, free entries will force the sick and the elderly to travel long distances to fill their prescriptions, or worse yet, maybe do without them. Although the consumer protection story here is merely a cover for rent seeking, it's a compelling story, nonetheless, and one that can't be rebutted with theory alone. So we need empirical evidence to answer these questions. First, do geographic entry restrictions harm consumers through higher prices and less convenience? And second, are these restrictions ne nonetheless necessary to assure that consumers retain reasonable access to pharmacies? So what type of evidence could the Irish Competition Authority bring to bear? Well, first, in the analogous category, they could look to U.S. Certificate of Need laws. These laws limit entry for a variety of health care providers in a variety of U.S. jurisdictions. They're mainly justified to assure that incumbents are profitable enough to make sure the consumers have access to health care providers. Well, a relatively large literature suggests that these laws lead to higher prices and provide consumers with no countervailing benefits. And these certificate of need laws are sufficiently similar to those to pharm the pharmacy restriction entry restriction laws that the Irish Competition Authority is dealing with, that this empirical literature could be useful. Second, let's look at direct empirical evidence. Well, looking at the peer review literature, there's an article by Showermans and Verboven in the Rand Journal of Economics studying entry restrictions in the Belgian pharmacy market. They find that removing these restrictions will actually lower prices and may increase the number of pharmacies and would not reduce the number of pharmacies. This study is directly on point would be very useful. Finally, if the Irish Competition Authority had sufficient time, or they thought that this would be the type of issue that they would be dealing with in the future, they may want to invest in their own internal, in developing their own empirical evidence. How would they go about doing this? Well, as we discussed before, they would want to look at variation in regulations across different jurisdictions. They would want, they could measure the price and output and variety and number of pharmacies in jurisdictions with restrictions and jurisdictions without restrictions. And depending on the data available, they could employ a quasi-experimental methodology, before and after methodology, or a cross-sectional cross methodology. 
Finally, they could engage in a case study. They could find a jurisdiction that either adopted these restrictions or got rid of these restrictions and see carefully document what happened in these markets. Well, it looks like the Irish Competition Authority has a lot of empirical evidence that they could turn to, and I wish them luck. And I hope that you will find this discussion helpful as you go forward with your competition advocacy. Thanks for your time. Thank you, James. We now move from the George Mason University to the Comisión Federal de Competencia de México in the Federal District for insights from one competition authority that has been very active on the advocacy front. Hi there, my name is Paolo Benedetti and I'm the Director General of Institutional and International Affairs at the uh, Mexican Federal Competition Commission. Let me start by saying that at the Federal Competition Commission, we dedicate significant, a significant portion of agency resources to competition advocacy. Our experience is that it, ha it has been one of the most effective tools for change in Mexico. Most, most of our work is around uh, introducing competition principles into laws and regulations via opinions or participation in meetings, as well as, well as when the CFC has a formal seat at the table. The first lesson is big public awareness on the need for reform. We have to take into account that when we try to push for uh, the reforms to the status quo that competition agencies uh, normally uh, push for, we face a serious collective action challenge. That is, the gains from reform are scattered, but losses are concentrated, normally in players with a lot of political influence. We also have to take into account that legislators or policymakers are human. That is, they will weigh political costs and benefits of reform for them. Uh, public awareness is the only tool, in a way, to counteract lobbying by vested interests. And finally, we also have to take into account that building, building awareness takes time and effort. But in our experience, it pays off in many aspects of the agency work. The main conclusion from the first lesson is get allies however loose before embarking on reform. Now the second lesson would be make sure that the discussion is public. You have to take into account that the public is your main constituency and that it's harder for legislators or policymakers to argue that consumer welfare needs to take a back seat to producer interests when consumers are actually listening. Public discussion makes it more difficult for legislators or policymakers to sit on their hands. And you have to take into account also that your first challenge is overcoming inactivity. You have to be in mind also that the most persuasive arguments against reforms can be made in public. Keep the language as plain as possible. That is, hone your arguments to a simple, straightforward story. Grandma as we often say here, has to understand it. Quantification of benefits from reform can play a crucial role in driving the point home. You also have to bear in mind that it's about consumers. Nobody understands or cares about uh, overall efficiency or uh, sophisticated uh, arguments. Also, you have to take into account that you don't have to be afraid of polemicizing. Every unanswered argument is a point for vested interest. And also, don't be afraid of oversimplifying. It's better to keep it plain and simple. Sometimes it has to be black versus white. Gray means no reform. The fourth lesson is that you need to understand how media works. In these regards, you have to take into account that the media can be your biggest ally or enemy in promoting reforms. In order to make it your, your biggest ally, you need to understand how media works. Press releases, for example, get media interest in your issues. They provide some degree of control on how information is presented to the public. Journalists are more likely to report the story your way. Press releases should be written as you want your story to appear in the news. Keep, in that sense, press releases brief, clear and to the point. 
also provide attention grabbing uh, attention attention grabbing titles it is also very important i would say to cultivate relationship with journalists editors that cover your issues also you get to know the media's deadlines and better days and adapt to them. My conclusion here would be use media to ensure that competition issues are kept on the public agenda. The fifth lesson that we have learned throughout uh, all these years is invoke international practice and let foreign experts make your point. In this regard, you have to take into account that consistency with international practice gives comfort uh, to non-experts pretty much everybody but yourself and the vested interest. Foreign experts tend also to be seen as unbiased and therefore they are more credible sometimes than the agency, which naturally holds uh, a stake in the outcome. My conclusion here, it's not you who is crazy and there is a second, third, fourth opinion to attest it. The sixth lesson we have learned is do the homework and the legwork. Discussions are likely to be multi-actor, that is, politicians, decision makers, policy makers, agency, vested interests, and hopefully consumers. You need to lead, and often from behind. It's important to be in mind that you need to be out there, that is, go to Congress, visit policy makers, media, and decision makers, get to know these words, and get to be known there. Hired lobbyists should be Sherpas, not substitutes for you. My final point here would be never undervalue an opportunity to explain. You never know for sure what influence your interlocutor has. And perhaps my conclusion would be nobody wants reform as much as you do and you have to act accordingly. Our seventh recommendation would be to quantify the benefits and costs of your recommendations. That is, quantify the cost of, the, of keeping the status quo and the potential benefits of reform. Also, want progress and success. And here you have to be in mind that the cost and benefit figures are easier to understand and more appealing than the economic and legal explanations that, are, that often lie behind them. The eighth recommendation would be pick your battles. That is, Assess the likelihood of success of your advocacy strategy. Then, pick the battles you know you can win. If you have to enter a battle that you are likely to lose, wait whether the cost of losing is less than the cost of not engaging. And finally, realize that if you lose a battle, at the end you could end up worse than before you enter it. That is, do the homework before choosing your fights. Thank you, Paolo, for those practical tips. Next, calling on agency heads from various jurisdictions, my colleague Deirdre Trapp will now host a roundtable discussion exploring the broader issues, some sensitive, which often surround advocacy projects. So with me here today in Washington are Philip Collins, uh, Chairman of the UK Office of Fair Trading, Mihai Gawamab, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Namibian Competition Commission, Felipe Arrazada, he's the National Economic Prosecutor of the Chilean Competition Authority, and Dan Schloblum, uh, who's the Director General of the Swedish Competition Authority. Our panellists have a wealth of experience in uh, managing successful advocacy programmes, and together we want to explore how they've managed advocacy in areas where there were strong interest groups, both within and outside government. So welcome, uh, panel Thank members. You. Welcome. Uh, let's get started by considering the first, uh, a first question. So what's worked best in terms of effective competition advocacy in your jurisdictions? Anybody prepared to offer some examples? I'm Dan. happy to go first. Thank I, you. Thank you, Deirdre. Yeah, so uh, in, in my experience, you, you need to invest uh, considerably mm -hmm. into successful advocacy. And uh, I'll try to give you a few uh, ex memories and experiences uh, from, from that uh, to illustrate my mm -hmm. point. So my first point would be um, if you spread your advocacy efforts too thinly, mm -hmm. considering the resources that you have at hand, you risk, as you do in normal casework, to, to achieve nothing on any of those projects. So you need to be 
prioritizing your advocacy efforts and you need to consider who the recipient is, what kind of uh, uh, proposals that uh, he might or might not be interested in and how you should package those proposals. But um, I think the lesson to learn is that you need to focus, you need to, to have a, a plan and present things that the, the recipient, the government can, can use uh, and relate to. And if I may take a, a moment to make just one more point. Yes, of course. Uh, the other thing I would make is uh, recommend is that you use your networks. You develop and you make good use of your networks, both domestic and international. Uh, and I think the way to do this is to invest in building your networks, uh, not when it's time to do the advocacy, but before. Yes. Because when the government proposal that you dislike for whatever reason comes along, that's not the time to try to build alliances with uh, with other agencies. Yes, absolutely. Philip, I think yeah. we had quite a similar experience Sure, we in did, the yes. I mean, I think in terms of what works best, it's important to recognize actually there are many different forms and types of competition advocacy. So, and what works best depends slightly on the nature of the problem and the issues you're, you're trying to deal with. Uh, the attitude of the interested parties, uh, the attitude of the government towards both the agency and to competition advocacy generally. Uh, and I think Dan's made an, an important point that actually trying to build a portfolio of work. So uh, you're not just reliant on one or two projects and you've got some projects that are perhaps longer term, medium term, and some that are very short term so you can demonstrate your, your agility. Um, in the UK, we found that some of the projects are really quite long term, and in particularly in the professions where we've uh, tackled restrictions on competition in the professions, notably in legal services and dentistry. We find that quite often you have to follow those for a significant number of years. Initial reports get uh, referred to specialist committees that then look at them. Uh, they come back and report to ministers who then ask parliament to introduce legislation. It takes time, so you need to, as Dan says, you need to invest. You need to invest in the skill set but you also need to invest in a variety of projects uh, to make sure that you've actually got um, the best, the best um, set of, of competition advocacy at work. Does persistence pay in Chile, Felipe? What, what we have been working uh, on advocacy, it's, it's, it's specialty on, on sector studies, mm -hmm. uh, but much more focused, and also on drafting guidelines. But again, prioritization, I think, is the key. I mean, you really have to choose uh, some uh, sector that are uh, the best one. Yeah, what about you? Yeah, from, from our part of the world, uh, there is still need to engage and inform and educate not just the government officials, but also the legislative and the judiciary. I think there is a fair regard for the judiciary to better understand on competition principles. Um, the issue that actually uh, that we are confronted with currently is, is the market studies or rather the sector reform studies. Um, we are increasingly getting around health. Uh, there is also issues around the retail sector and there are strong anti-competitive practices. The cons consumer, the main industry, do not necessarily understand how that uh, plays itself out uh, in terms of enforcement, but, but we are basically looking at it and we are researching on it. Yeah. So market studies seem to be... Uh, the most effective weapon, uh, possibly, for driving change in this area. You've all referred to market studies and the ability to have that uh, element in your toolkit uh, to push that sort of work forward as being a key. Could any of you describe some recent experiences where you've been less successful? Tricky one, I know this. Nobody <laughs> likes to admit to things that haven't gone quite as well, particularly in this area, which is very sensitive politically. But who'd like to share uh, some thoughts on, you know, where uh, some of the advocacy has not gone quite as one might have hoped and what were the lessons learned from those sorts of experiences? Oh, Felipe, you look I, like you're ready to dive I, I, I in can, here. I can volunteer, <laughs> I can volunteer. Um, well, in Chile, uh, uh, as, as I said, uh, we tried to, to conduct uh, at least one market study per year and we have done that on the construction sector, on the bank sector, and last year we did on the private health insurance sector. Oh, that is interesting, because Mihai was saying health was a big issue for you guys yeah. as well. Very much. Uh, yeah. Which is, well, a, a very sensitive uh, market mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of uh, pub, uh, public policy discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say three main issues I mean, uh, on, on, on pursuing this uh, market study. Uh, the first one is we decided uh, to outsource the study to a university. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, which I think uh, it has some pro and cons uh, uh, with respect of that decision. Uh, it is supposed to be more independent. Uh, the risk of lack of information and the risk of error, errors uh, are not taken by the agency. And, and also somehow does not compromise the agency if something comes mm -hmm. up that could be something that you would like to investigate uh, and use your uh, enforcement powers. Of course. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it, it is tricky, maybe it's not that easy to select the team. Uh, you might face that, uh, that the team is not, uh, not as competent as you would like to. Um, then the second uh, issue is, is public information or private mm -hmm. information. And, and at, at least in, uh, in Chile, normally uh, public information is, 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 is not really uh, available uh, and, and normally it's, it's not in good quality. Mm -hmm. and so uh, so you, you have to request private information and then it came all the issues on confidentiality and then it's very important to be in a good mood with the regulator, uh, in, in this case with the health regulator that obviously have much more knowledge and information about the sector. And the third issue, um, uh, it's, uh, well, we wanted this, uh, to put it on the table, a discussion on, on public policy, you mm -hmm. know, and because we understood that there are many issues and some of them are highly regulated. So. Uh, when when the study was completed and, and we sent it to a congressman, we sent it to a regulator, to a ministry of health, and uh, everybody uh, was happy receiving the document. But then uh, a lot of uh, media attention came up because of the study. A group of congressmen, senators, uh, decided uh, to knock our door for requesting <laughs> an investigation um, uh, which is now underway, an investigation uh, basically based on the conclusions of our report. So I would call this a boomerang effect. Yeah, so they turned mm. your report against yes. you. Mm. Yeah. So yes. uh, my, my thought on, on this regard probably is that uh, you have to be very carefully because sometimes you, you know where you start at the beginning of the process uh, because I think, and, and I'm still thinking that it's a good, pro I mean, it's a good effort uh, yeah. to put it on this advocacy project but you never know how you ended uh, with, with mm -hmm. the project. And in this case, I think it was a boomerang effect because uh, uh, somehow we, we put a lot of more uh, meat on the debate. But on the other hand, uh, we, ha we have a, an investigation uh, on enforceability of the antitrust law because of the con one of the conclusions of the report. Chair, so there's some fascinating yeah. insights there on yeah. governance and, yeah. uh, and building networks, which is a point that Dan mm. made yeah. earlier about yeah. making sure that you're properly engaged with your sort of sponsoring government departments in this, in I this think area. I one point to make in, in relation to external consultants, we've also found historically this to be an issue. And I think the question is uh, the kind of procurement process you use and what filters you use to find the right people but also the way in which you use internal resources combined with external resources. So that it's clearly an external report, but it can be supported by the internal resources of the agency. But actually project managing those is not always easy. Or it's easy to look. You can't just contract the whole thing out. Yeah. I think one further point I'd make, um, which goes back to your example, is the importance of evaluating uh, advocacy work, because you do need to try and make sure you pick up the lessons from each piece of work, go back and look over it, and we've had several examples from our early um, studies, particularly in relation to things like pharmacies and taxes, both of which seem to be sort of endemic problems to agencies all around the world, where um, with the benefit of hindsight, having gone back and looked at the, the study we produced, actually we found that we could have done things differently and that would have produced a better result. So on taxes, whilst the study was very good, it was roundly attacked by a parliamentary committee, whereas if we'd actually addressed it in a different way, it would be much easier to deal with. And on pharmacies, uh, we weren't actually able to persuade the government to go as far as uh, we wanted them to do. And that meant at the end of the day, whilst we achieved some benefits, we didn't achieve all the benefits that we could have realised. It's interesting mm. how health, again, becomes yes. a real hot topic, doesn't yeah, it, yeah. in terms of the stakeholders who have got influence over the, over the decision-making. And, and of course, in health, you've got some very powerful vested interests. Mm. Yes. Very, very powerful vested mm. interests. Yes. Tell us about the, uh, the your, your health study in uh, Namibia. 
Well, I mean, there, there was a independent private body that used to regulate health, and uh, it was not done according to law. So um, uh, through our investigation, we came to know of that, and we informed them that the way they actually fix tariffs or prices are not in best accord to the competition law. And that's where also the Ministry of Health took note and said that, well, they are not regulated. The government must actually regulate them in terms of the private structure. So what we are currently doing is that we are undertaking a study to look at the pricing structure and, and how the scheduling has been done. But most importantly, I think the Ministry of Health wants to come in in order to be in control of its statutory, statutory obligations mm. to afford um, um, health reform. And, and, and that's what we are busy at. It must be very tricky when you identify um, the ministry responsible uh, for the for the governance and, and regulation of a particular function, yeah. that it is the ministry itself that has um, uh, not completely followed the, the the due processes of law. That must be yes. a, a very tricky debate. So, 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 so was it the case really that they were, in a sense, sort of blessing anti-competitive practices being carried on by the healthcare professionals? Yes. It, yeah. It's just that they did yes. not know that they are anti-competitive yes. practices. Yes. And, yeah. and we, we came to make that away through our, our advocacy efforts. And now they are t taking uh, the warning and now they are stepping in, not really to govern them, but to create a statutory uh, kind of a structure uh, that can report to the Ministry of Health. So it's a pretty challenging area, this. You yeah. know, you yeah. have to take on the fights when, when necessary and yeah. Yeah. really challenge yeah. some entrenched views as to how things yeah. should happen and should be done for the future in sometimes Indeed. using third parties sometimes uh, putting your own political capital out there Indeed. to uh, yeah. brave <laughs> <laughs> so who's got some guidance on um, selecting which battles to fight and which ones to let go yeah. uh, any examples people would like to discuss well, should i lead off on that philip dive in. um I think it's um, important to think, before you start fighting any battles, to actually be thoroughly prepared. Um, so to make sure you actually know um, what the party's positions are likely to be, what the government's position is likely to be. Also think about, about timing. I mean, is now the appropriate time to think about doing a study in this sector? Because mm. if you do want to do a study, there may be a better time a little later, perhaps when you can go, your study will go better with the grain of, of policy initiatives. That's one point. Um, the second thing is to, to think very carefully about whether there really is a competition and markets problem here and what the issues are, because it's very easy to think there's a problem. And actually, when you get into it, you find it's not actually a competition problem. Or in fact, even if it is one, it's not one you can necessarily deal with. And you don't necessarily want in, to get into a battle where you can't actually, actually resolve it. And that leads to a third point, which is um, do try and confine yourself to dealing just with the competition and markets issues. It's very tempting to get into other policy areas, and clearly you need to take account of those. But actually getting drawn into policy areas which are outside your expertise is not a good thing for a competition agency to do. Otherwise, you can be uh, accused of going outside your mandate. Mm -hmm. I think a few other points about um, conducting the study. You do need to be very open and transparent with all the parties. And there are different ways of doing this. You can call for information, a general call for information. You can have industry round tables. You can go to industry events. You can have different groups of stakeholders. So a degree of openness is very important. And then uh, you need to have a, a very full, thorough report, which you publish, which um, explains your position, explains your position very carefully. And then, um, I think follow-up work is very important in some cases. Actually, you produce a report, but then that will go to government, say typically it'll go to the industry. Uh, that report is likely to be examined by, for instance, parliamentary committees. It'll be examined in the media. You need to think about what your follow-on strategy is, making sure that your recommendations are, are implemented. And I think just one, one final point around, around resources, and Dan made this point, I think, earlier uh, in, in the beginning of this session which is around investing in resources. Because you do want, if you're doing competition advocacy, to have a range of different projects with different timescales and looking at different issues. So you can build a, a body of advocacy, advocacy work which can then be used in other cases. So those would be my thoughts about, about battles to fight and how to fight them. Dan, Dan you spoke to us earlier on about the, yeah. the Swedish um, moves to ensure that competition policy was properly 
uh, established, instituted in, in the financial crisis, and there was no stepping away. Yeah. Um, I think, do you have other examples of Sweden, or where you have taken a step back? Yeah. No, but in, in uh, I would perhaps make this point in terms of uh, with selecting battles. Uh, I share very much what Philip was saying that you need to look at sort of the entire picture. I mean, is, is now the right time and and preferably if you can, I mean, speak to your government, the recipient of the report, before you even start thinking mm -hmm. about making the report. I mean, they are, the, the, the people there that you interface with, they will know if, if you say that, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about looking at the pharmacy market or whatever market, uh, and we, we might present the report with some suggestions in uh, six months time or a year time or whatever, Th then they know, is there any readiness to receive mm -hmm. a report on That's that? That's very important. And, and if they say, well, uh, actually, the timing of that is not so good because there's this other policy initiative going on or whatever, then put that idea in, in, a, in, a, mm -hmm. in a book somewhere and take it up when, uh, when time is right. Because investing all those resources and then producing a report and then if there's no readiness to, to, to do anything with, with the investment you've made, that is pretty pointless. Yeah, well, it goes to Felipe's point, doesn't it, about whether you are trying to do something that will lead to enforcement action, uh, you know, your boomerang, or whether it's it's something where you're trying to encourage another government agency to take its proper role and take proper steps to, to change things within its own uh, sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all very much for that fascinating discussion uh, of some very tricky and sensitive issues, but I'm sure uh, we've covered a lot of useful ground for people uh, for people today. So I'd like to thank Philip Collins and Dan Schlomberg and Mihai Goab mm. and uh, Felipe Arazabal. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our panel of agency heads for sharing their experiences and the lessons learned from them. We now move to Washington DC for an interview with Commissioner Maureen Olhausen at the Federal Trade Commission. So we bring this film to a fitting close uh, with someone who's been very active in the competition advocacy field for many years. Uh, I'm here at the United States Federal Trade Commission in Washington with Commissioner uh, Maureen Olhausen. Uh, Commissioner Olhausen has been personally involved in leading competition advocacy for the FTC for the past four years and uh, has had a long involvement uh, preceding that. Welcome Commissioner Olhausen. Uh, thank you so much, Judah. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Could you share with our audience today uh, the benefits that your agency has brought uh, to the American public through the efforts be that you made personally and, and through your organization uh, on comp with competition advocacy? Um, certainly. Uh, one of the topics, you know, we're primarily a law enforcement agency and we bring competition and consumer protection actions. But there are certain areas in which we can't bring an enforcement action, such as where a state or a sister federal agency or Congress is considering um, a regulation or uh, a bill that may um, impact consumers. Uh, sometimes uh, these can benefit consumers, uh, they can increase um, a choice for consumers, they might provide some uh, additional consumer protections that would be beneficial, uh, but um, often or uh, sometimes in, in other instances uh, they are not so beneficial for consumers. So we're able to bring our expertise in competition principles, in economics, and in consumer protection to bear uh, to, to weigh in on these provisions and, and um, suggest ways uh, that uh, the protections, the benefits could be achieved without um, impacts on competition. Uh, one of the other issues that, that comes to mind in this area is the fact that you know, we typically challenge private restra restraints on competition, but public restraints can uh, have an even worse impact uh, on competition, on benefits and, uh, to consumers and consumer welfare because they tend to be durable, they're enforced uh, by the government, mm -hmm. and it's hard for the market to go around them because it might be uh, illegal to adopt a different method of business. That's a very interesting insight, and obviously the more challenging end of the, uh, of the spectrum, I guess, Yes. to deal with. Um, so where does the FTC primarily engage in, in competition advocacy? So primarily we engage in competition ad advocacy uh, before the state, state legislatures, okay. sometimes state regulatory boards, before other federal agencies, uh, sometimes before um, bar associations or professional associations. And that's where we would file things like um, formal comments, uh, we also uh, might file, we might appear live, do testimony. Uh, we also file in courts. We file amicus briefs uh, on certain issues. 
But um, I, we also like to think of competition advocacy quite broadly to also include some of the uh, policy work we do by having workshops, um, doing studies, uh, economic studies, legal studies, and issuing reports. Uh, and then a, uh, uh, another channel is through doing um, more informal things like this mm -hmm. discussion that we're having, okay. uh, doing uh, speeches, articles, and, and things like that. So what would you say your uh, principal or main objectives are with this field of endeavor, this large amount of, of work? Well, what we try to do, uh, which is what we try to do in, in all our efforts, is to enhance consumer welfare. Uh, and that's sort of our general overarching principle. Uh, but the way, the way we do that and the three areas uh, on which we focus primarily are in facilitating um, entry, so making it uh, easier for new businesses, new business models uh, to enter the market, uh, and then conversely opposing new barriers to entry. Uh, eliminating perverse market incentives, that's another important uh, area, and then also focusing on uh, making it easier for consumers to get useful information so that they can make decisions for themselves and make better informed decisions. So, Commissioner, I'd next like to discuss with you the benefits of an advocacy program. Uh, could you describe some of the primary benefits of, of programs that work like this uh, for, for the benefits of our, our audience? Well, as I already mentioned, um, oftentimes advocacy is the only way to address mm -hmm. certain anti-competitive um, regulations and laws or provisions that are out there, uh, either uh, through uh, uh, because it's being promulgated by a, a state or it's protected in some way from antitrust enforcement, maybe through a, a, an exemption of some kind. It's also very cost effective. Um, it can be... Um, uh, based, uh, you know, with a little bit of staff effort uh, by drawing upon the, uh, the uh, industry expertise or the agency expertise in certain industries that we have and our economists. It's much less expensive and resource intensive than bringing a case, so this mm -hmm. might be a good way for an agency with reduced resources to try to make a difference and start to um, improve conditions for consumers. Uh, the other benefit that it brings is that um, it can really identify any competitive regulations and by doing that highlight the, the cost that um, consumers will, uh, will suffer. It also assigns political responsibility for them. You know, why is this happening? Who, who is pushing this? Uh, who are the beneficiaries? And uh, it kind of gives a voice to consumer interests that aren't necessarily part of the larger debate. Uh, and then through that also bring more scrutiny to what's going on through um, often when we do an advocacy, there'll be some press uh, involved in it, or, or sometimes we can spur a greater um, academic or economic research uh, so that um, more evidence is developed on the likely impact of these kinds of regulations. Uh, why do you believe the FTC's program has been, uh, been such a success? I think it's for, for several reasons. One, we, we really have um, worked hard to uh, ground all of our work in uh, firm, uh, firmly in competition principles, in economic uh, theory, and where possible um, uh, in economic evidence. We, we do look for empirical work that, and sometimes we do it ourselves, but uh, also look for any empirical support that might be available. Um, we also, as I mentioned, draw upon the uh, industry uh, knowledge and experience that we've gained through our enforcement activities. Um, and also, I think our reputation as an agency that is concerned about consumers, that does take our uh, consumer protection and competition protection rules very seriously, helps give our, our opinions a little more weight uh, when, when um, uh, before another policymaker. So you stay within your, if you like, your areas of core competency, in a sense. That, that's correct. That's yeah. correct. Uh, one other thing that we do to try to make sure uh, we can continue to be successful in our um, competition advocacy areas. We do regular assessments. So we follow up. Uh, this started um, under my tenure and continues today. We follow up after we have filed a, um, an advocacy. You mentioned earlier on the analytical uh, framework, the analytical approach that you bring to the work. Could you say a little bit more about how you uh, introduce the work of economists into, into this sphere? Uh, yes, so the, um, the economic analysis is a very important part of, of what we do. Uh, and I think that is shown that where we've got, uh, you know, a good um, economic analysis and particularly good empirical evidence uh, has really helped us be successful in a number of areas. I mean, sometimes you go in and you're offering an opinion and um, another policymaker might say, well, why is your opinion any more, you know, likely to be correct than our opinion? Uh, but if we can offer some sort of um, evidence, some sort of empirical study that says, 
well, on balance, consumers are actually worse off when you introduce these kinds of restrictions. They don't get the consumer protection that you, you know, you think that they will get. Mm -hmm. That really helps um, help sway um, the policymakers to to make the right decision that make consumers um, better off. How else? Um, how do you go about prioritizing or selecting the cases that you take up? Because there must be many potential calls on your time and, and resources. Yeah, so we try to focus um, on areas that are of particular importance to consumers and where we have particular uh, expertise. Uh, it would be difficult to try to address every kind of um, anti-competitive uh, proposed regulation or restraint that may come up. So uh, we, we try uh, not to be so broad as to um, uh, be unfocused. So we try to focus on areas where we can um, bring our, uh, our expertise to bear, um, and where we have good evidence, uh, often where sometimes the FTC itself has produced it, but where there might be a, a, you know, otherwise a good body of evidence, um, empirical evidence out there. Uh, we also try to focus on areas where there's consensus within the commission. So we do things, for example, where there's going to be new, new issues coming up to look a little bit over the horizon. So as I mentioned, we focused on e-commerce issues. Another area where we've uh, had a lot of focus on is on new forms of health care delivery. Mm -hmm. So we've uh, looked at things, uh, restrictions on nurse practitioners, restrictions on the online sales of contact lenses, and things like that. So we've tried to pay attention to areas that are important to consumers uh, and also areas where new and innovative business models might be running into some um, barriers that don't necessarily um, make consumers better off in the long run. Fantastic. Commissioner, thank you very much indeed for your time. That's been a really wonderful insight uh, into the work of the FTC's program in consumer advocacy. You also got an incredibly successful uh, program and uh, it's great being able to share your, your time and the accomplishments of, of you, yourself and your team with us. Thank oh, you very much. Oh, thank you very much, dear. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner Olhausen and Deirdre, for that insightful interview. That concludes this ICN module on competition advocacy. We would like to thank the Irish Competition Authority, Professor Cooper, the Comision Federal de Competencia de México, FTC Commissioner Olhausen, and Deirdre Trapp for their gracious and valuable assistance with this program. And of course, the agency heads for giving their time to participate in the panel. And thanks to you, our audience, for joining us today. We do hope that you've been inspired to consider the important role that competition advocacy can play for your agency and to have illustrated some of the resources that you might deploy. Thank you again.